I like your nurse's uniform, guy. These are OR scrubs. Oh, are they? <laughs> well, they're totally inappropriate for the occasion. Well, I didn't know we were going to dinner. That's because you weren't invited. <laughs> Welcome back to the harbor. I'm your host, the Kino Cowboy. I'm here with my co-host, Scott Keefe, Harbor alum, Dylan Rodriguez, and Wes Anderson, Topo Chico aficionado. <laughs> Pull them up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And there Wes. you go. Who okay. is Topo Chico? Topo, Topo means mole, so I always read that as mole boy. I know that's not the proper translation, but I always like to think I'm drinking like mole boy sweat whenever I'm drinking like some living underground in the pair of sewers or something. Oh, see, I was thinking of like, do you remember Austin Powers Gold member whenever it yeah. with the big fucking mole? And that's what I think of when I hear the word mole. I think oh, yeah. Mole, 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 mole. Well, I just, I just always think of Fred Savage every second of every day. Oh, yeah. So, right. What are yours, man? Shit. Today, we're talking about Rushmore 1999, Wes Anderson's sophomore effort written by him and Owen Wilson and directed by him. Kind of wish that they would have him and Owen Wilson would have teamed up to write another movie by now, but they still haven't, but they came up together. That's why they're doing what they're doing. This is the criterion I got at the library after I watched fantastic Mr. Fox at Max's age. And, um, this is not really the movie that you watch at 15, but you do, I guess, cause it's something to watch, but, uh, I it's think kind I of think weird. Why don't you watch it at 15? Yeah, it's but it's weird to be Max's that. age, and then you don't really get the whole film. I feel like what it's going for because you're at that age, and you're for me at least, I'm just as naive and awkward as Max Fisher, the original incel. Um, yeah, you know. well, I mean, did you try to bang any of your teachers? No, okay, well, you got that going for you. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Um, what's your history with this film, Dylan? uh it's just like you i watched it when i was probably 15 yeah i'd say i was 15 maybe maybe late 14 but that was like the relevant time that like i was just getting into movies in general you know like really just like watching every single thing i could not because i liked any of it just because i like you know just i was around that age right i wanted to know everything about everything you know and this is one of those movies and i remember I watched it and I didn't, I don't know if I had seen really any Wes Anderson before. What have I seen before it? I think I might have seen like Fantastic Mr. Fox and that was uh, my intro and uh, maybe the Royal Tenant Bums. Maybe I, I don't know for sure. I remember watching this one and it, it really was like a moment where I was like amidst all the movies that I was watching where, you know, I was like, oh, this is like a good movie because people say it's a good movie. You know, it's like, well, this is a classic because it's a classic, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I watched this one and, and like, I don't know, it was one of those movies that like actually like really uh, as a 15 year old, it really like, I, yeah, you're right. I, di- I didn't fully understand all the themes, but something in it like spoke to me that I didn't really fully understand. But I was like, this movie is for me. You know, like this is like a movie. Huh. This is a movie that I'm I'm going to come back to for like, you know, forever, basically. Yeah, I, I love this movie. This is. This is like the the one that always in my ranking of West movies, it's the one that it's like always number one fluctuating, you know, it's it's always right there at the top, basically. Interesting. Well, not you? that you asked, because you're disinterested in my opinion, but I, well, I, I hadn't gotten to you yet. <laughs> but go ahead. Uh, we've been beefing I'm all in a game. mood today. I yeah, well. Well, we know what you said, Dylan. Um, I, I I watched this movie a bit later than you guys. I was late teens, early twenties. I don't remember if I was high school or early college. Um, my my experience with this movie. This is my second time seeing this movie. Uh, we've covered Wes Anderson on the cast, and I like Wes Anderson. I am not a Wes Anderson aficionado as much as you two are. Um. Although I enjoy his work and I obviously respect him as an auteur 
You know, anybody with that unique of a style, you have to uh, respect. And I enjoy watching his movies. I've liked every movie um, I've seen of his. Have I loved every movie I've seen of his? Not necessarily, but sure. Um, I really enjoyed this on my second viewing, and it might be my favorite Wes Anderson now. Oh, yeah. Um, Because my first viewing, I don't know what kind of headspace I was in. Sometimes it just happens where I, we, we liter media literacy has become almost a tired meme and phrase at this point. But I feel like my media literacy slash all of my weird late adolescent, early adult emotions got tied up in it where I, I almost got, and maybe I felt threatened because in a lot of ways I was, and in some ways still am like, um, Max. The, main, the main character or Rushmore and that I was like I don't know trying to compensate and like be smarter than I really was you know not that I wasn't smart but I was you know I guess kind of like him too ADHD and screwed around um <laughs> but uh I also thought like I kind of viewed Max or Rushmore whatever his name is I'm gonna be calling Max. Rushmore for the cast no that's <laughs> my bit I'm going to call him Rushmore for the Max cast. Rushmore yeah. and Max Rushmore. Max Rushmore. Ray Star Wars. Um, <laughs> when Max, I always thought Max Rushmore was like, in how much of <laughs> an avatar for Wes Anderson do you think he is? That's what I wonder. He's he's like, uh, not to go back to this, uh, this is actually a really good book. I was being funny earlier, but mm -hmm. really good Just book. read it to us. We got time. <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll read it. But that is actually a thing that they talk about how this is it's pretty it's it's Wes Anderson. It's like 99% Wes Anderson. It makes sense. Down, it makes down, sense. Yeah, it, on like an older teacher. Like it, it is a hundred percent Wes Anderson. She's cute. That's also watching this movie when you're like 30. I'm like, that I would fall in love with that woman. That's fine. Teacher librarian type, <laughs> totally me. Totally me. Speaking of librarian. When I pulled this up and said this was a library copy I never returned fucking 12, <laughs> 13, 14 years ago, I forgot I was saying it in front of a former librarian. I didn't get sh any shit for it, though. So, Oh, no. it's You know why? Because I, um, for, first of all, when I was a librarian, I was drunk on power and just would renew all my stuff over and over and just <laughs> keep it out for months at a time yeah. um, and do it for my friends. I was, I, I was like, it was like I was the prison like cafeteria guy giving my friends all like extra biscuits and milk cartons or whatever they get there. Um, gruel. <laughs> but, and, and then also I'm applying to jobs at the library right now. And I have like six books overdue that I don't know where they are. I lost them oh, in the movie. Shit. Yeah. I mean, but here's the thing. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. There are libraries that have complete many that have completely gotten rid of fines because um, they realize people take books back more because they aren't worried about like, is the librarian going to be in about? I've hung out with librarians. There's nerds. You can kick their ass pretty easily. It's fine. Yeah. Don't, yeah, don't be intimidated. But I don't think anyone's ever been intimidated by a librarian. I don't think, I don't think you have to worry about that, Scott. Hey, nobody's ever been intimidated by me. So I, I at least have that <laughs> data point. Anyway, this is not a librarian cast. Um, yeah, they don't. That's something Max Rushmore would do, though. Um, <laughs> let's check it out. And not I want to recant my statement, my joke, the tired joke, at least in the film community, that Max is a incel. He, you can't really be. I don't think it's fair to be. You can't be an incel at fifteen. No, like, I mean you. Well, you can have some incel ideology. I know, but problem. what I mean is, this like, was a pre-Andrew Tate movie. This is most Andrew are Tate. Not. The movie itself says no, he's not an incel because he does, in fact, get the girl. He gets the girl. He gets Margaret Yang. I know, the, but what I'm saying oh, is like, cutie, so cutie they're pie. So cute. They're so he's so cute. cute. And he's like, what are you, what are you doing, Jason Schwartzman? You're not trying. You know, uh, most people, most 15 year olds, probably shouldn't be getting laid yet. That's my opinion. So, like, should not or yeah. should. No, I, I just, think I think 15 is too young. I think uh, yeah. I should wait a little bit. Only, well, yeah, especially if you're a woman. And especially when you're like Max Fisher, very yeah. uh, emotionally immature. Right. Yeah. 15 so. year olds, you should be banging like college girls. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. no, it's just like the allure of the film now in my late 20s. I'm almost 30 years old. It's just like looking back and and identifying with max and and because every single person whether they believe it or not when they're 14 15 years old had some sort of insufferable or cringe worthy aspect of them and and what they were doing while they were coming of age that's just how it is 
And I find that aspect endearing. Does he go too far in this film? Yes. But what? What? <laughs> he fucking cuts the brakes of Bill Murray's car. No, oh, yeah, that's that's you know, but Bill Murray's been kind of canceled. That's, that's too far, dude. What's well, the quote of the movie? It's uh, you know, I think trick to life is you gotta find something you want to do with the rest of your life and do it. For me, it's going to Rushmore. It's like <laughs> yeah. crazy. It's like if Van Wilder didn't get pussy. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think you know to actually get into like the actual themes of the movie that goes into so much about his like his trauma though about his grief about you know on that video in the video essay talk about Wes and grief this movie is littered with grief the 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 teacher grieving her fucking ex husband him yeah. and his dad grieving their dead wife slash mother like and and then Herman kind of grieving just like. His, his marriage uh, is on the rocks. Yeah, and, and which like is set wife. up when he when he does that dive into that stinky, dirty pool while she's yeah, his, talking to that other dude. He's like grieving like his station in life. You know, he, he he's yes. not and and he probably has some degree of PTSD from Vietnam. That's true. Oh yeah, exactly. Which this is something I noticed on the second viewing. Oh, we're jumping ahead to the second to last scene um, in the play when everybody's putting on their goggles and headphones and stuff, he doesn't put his on because he was in the war. He was, he was just like, yeah, this is this was That's Tuesday just... for me for like four years. I never yeah. thought about it that way. Oh yeah, yeah. no, he, yeah, no, and see so that that's why I think this it goes back to like why I love this movie so much that like you can see Wes like excuse me you can see like Wes like forming his style and you you still get you know his kind of like signature shot and and whatnot but like there is like a humanity that even though I love Wes's newer stuff I really do there is like a true like gritty humanity to this movie that I, it's really never been in any other in any of his other movies like it's as not much. as overly formalistic i would say royal tenon bombs is also very emotional especially with like the suicide scene and stuff like that it, it is but like it's still it's it's like it's like a storybook still you know yeah it, but this this is adolescent this is, and do you remember is, being 15 it sucked yeah, i hate yeah, it no that's why like i think going back to what i like how i came to this movie too I was talking about how I just was like inhaling everything I could, like movies, books, because I was like Max. I just wanted to know everything because yeah. I wanted to be the person that knew. I was that kid that was like, "Oh, you like Nirvana? Fucking name five songs." You know, like that. <laughs> I, I, like I was that kid, and like, and then watching this, I think when I, I remember when I first watched it, I was, I didn't register that like, "Oh, I am Max," but deep somewhere in me, I was like, "I am Matt." Like, you know what I mean? Where it's like, it I, sticks I with you. I didn't look at it in a critical way. Like, was it Adrian? Was that you who said like, Erdo no, Scott was like, you were like kind of resisting it because you could yeah. see yourself. Because I could see part of myself. And also for some reason, I thought like, even though obviously Max is a deeply flawed character because he's a kid. I thought like, what does Wes Anderson think? He's some boy genius. Does he some, yeah. which is also a weird jealousy thing. It was stupid. Yeah, um, and so like the way that you kind of resisted that because of that, mm -hmm. I was like attracted to it, even though I didn't really fully register why. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And so yeah, like that's I think it's why you know watching it over and over growing up, now I know why. But like it was that thing that kind of just I think it's what a good movie does. It kind of just sticks with you, even if you don't know exactly why. And then you and then you go out and try to like reason with it and try to understand it. You know, like in an actual deep. Uh, meaningful way you know that's why I, like, yeah, I love Rushmore man it's so good yeah it's like hmm. it definitely made me think about some things that I did at his age just to be like like what like um people uh, in 10th grade like a, a switch flipped and I in my head and it was like a night and day like okay I want to seek out good movie like Patrician shit like real and started watching this and Kubrick and like all these different and Fincher and all that stuff. And it was just like, now I was turning people down. They're like, you want to go see this movie? I'm like, no, it only has a 43% on Rotten Tomatoes, <laughs> you know, just like, oh man. And like, I totally would have discovered the beauty of the Planet of the Apes sequels a long time ago. If I wasn't such a hard ass about what oh. critics thought about movies. 
back Bro, then. But the, but the critics fucking love those movies, dude. I was just talking to you the other day about those fucking movies. No, man. they do. No, I'm the talking about like. The original sequels? I'm talking oh, about. Oh, you mean the original, original. Yeah, I'm talking about Beneath the Planet of the Apes, Conquest, those you shit, know, Escape. Those are terrible and I love them. I love like No, I, I think love they're them. great, but I'm just saying like. That's just an example of just the kind of shit that I would be like in 10th grade about stuff. And I, I don't know. All right. You have to come around to appreciating camp. Yeah. And get, um, which I do, I think, more than ever now. I love camp. I love pulp, pulpy stuff. Yeah. Um, well, as long as it's like, not too self indulgent. What don't? Everything is so like dripped in irony and ironic now that like real emotions are weird now. You know, like real earnest, like refreshing. It's, it's weird to people and they don't understand it. It's, you know what I mean? And it's Max Rushmore makes me think of (laughs) certain people. It's I'm staying with the bit. It's a stupid bit. I'm staying with it. Oh Um, yeah. I already already forgot that you've been saying Max Rushmore. Yeah. It's yeah. (laughs) It doesn't matter. Sorry, sorry, Scott. You go. But Mr. Rushmore, he, um, a lot there's definitely a lot of kids who are like in a rush to get to adulthood which is not the way to you should appreciate whatever stage of life you're in um yes. he almost makes me think of the way adults act though in i think there's a lot of grown people who refuse to ever embrace any childishness um i think that's why herman bloom is attracted to max cuz he does see this precocious kid but Let's say, yeah, say and, and, and Max hanging out with talking to Bloom makes him more feel adult. But Bloom talking to Max, um, they meet in the middle, and it makes him remember some sort of vitality that he lost because he's a sad old Bill Murray now. Max uh, is like a weird character because at one point, at one on one hand, he wants to be a kid forever. He wants to be in school forever, but at the same time, he wants to be with the adults. He is in this, this weird arrested development state of like, I guess, grief where he doesn't know what he is, you know? But if the child prodigy grows up and becomes, I mean, they become a normal adult, they cease to be a child prodigy. Exactly. Um, which, right, yeah. which is why like gifted kid syndrome, you know, if you heard of it, uh, like it's so hard. I don't know how to study. I don't know how to do that. Um, that's why I picked a bullshit major. I was like, I'm going to study the humanities. Um, and now I do a film podcast, which got a thousand subscribers, boys. Thank yes, you. Thank guys. you. 1.1, 1. 1 actually. But 1. yeah. 1.1. 1. 1. But uh, well, yeah, I figure 100 people. Are you going to finally pop your pussy on live now? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who's yeah. Yeah, following us now. If you're more, more importantly, Adrian said if he ever gets, whenever he gets a channel to a thousand, he's going to throw a pizza party. So that's why I've been doing this for the past that's couple of right. years. Um, everything and now we're done so <laughs> yeah thank you channel's over i get my pizza yeah the uh the interesting aspect of the film is that he is flunking every single one of his classes because he stretched himself thin and that's such an ex- underachiever every thing extracurricular like, activity known to man and that's also such a like oh well if i don't really try i can't really fail which is such a self-protective thing yeah He's afraid, he, to get, afraid of real things. Right, which he's clearly very smart, but he also thinks Latin America actually has to do with the language Latin. Yeah. yeah I mean, he's <laughs> so a definition of like, of like, you know, a pretentious young kid. Like he he thinks he knows things. and He knows maybe the base, but he doesn't really actually fully understand anything. Yeah, every time every time those Scottish kids beat him up, I'm like, yeah, get him. Yeah, well, this, this, is the, this, is the, this is the only movie where I might actually root for the bully a little bit. Yeah, well, it's the it's just an interesting mix of like endearing and honest love for what he does, but also that pseudo intellectual side that no one understanding ki- it. Kids his age have like when he's the the best example is when he's sitting next to Mrs. Cross out on the outside and he's wearing the red beret and he's reading a giant book called powers that be. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah you know, great death and, grips out. Oh yeah. True. It's, it's just, um, I don't know. It goes without saying. That's like, I mean, that's, no, it's, 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 it's I also, I also think what this movie makes me think of going back to, I got off track cause I do that. Um, cause I'm, I'm Max Rushmore, but <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of grown people who also 
in some ways are cosplaying adults. You yeah. know, they they especially dude, I've been just not even in. I've been reporting on circling the business world and at business events before. And it feels like the social contract is we all have to cosplay business people at the time. Yeah. And in my head, this is going to sound so dumb. Um, it's going to sound really dumb. In my head, I'm like, all you people in suits, every single one of you took a shit after your coffee this morning. Like, it's, I don't, it's, it, it, it's amazing to me. And that's, and it's amazing to me how many people seem to, I don't know, kind of, repre- everybody has their own coping mechanisms and everybody has a different upbringing where they have to age at different rates. But um, I, I arguably go too much into the man-child slant. Um, but I I meet a lot of people who I almost feel bad for them that they can't get in touch with that playfulness, which is why Max's character is sort of tragic because he does have so many things going for him at the same time, like B-15, which yeah. is why it's great when he goes to public school and gets public schooled. Although in, in a way, even though kids are like, who the hell is this kid? It's not like he's getting shoved into lockers and stuff, which is what a lesser filmmaker would have done at that plot point. Oh, they're just like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> like, yeah, which wouldn't that be your reaction? It wouldn't even yeah. be necessarily, let's beat him up. It would just be like, I, would, I don't know who this is. I'm going to stay away from him. Why is I would, he I, like that? I would think in my head, I'd be like, this dude is way too much. I don't want to look at him. So I would turn it away. Sounds exhausting. Yeah, what an yeah, overachiever. But also, like One, uh, Bill Murray's character is also... He obviously he's come to a point in his life where he has lost touch of that, and so he's looking for that. And I like that kind of melancholy take on him at first before he tries to get with Miss Cross. And yeah, like you said, when he's on the diving board and stuff, still smoking the cigarette, drinking, <laughs> you know. That's but um, wonderful scene. It's clearly just like it. it to exemplify that, he, he has two meathead sons that he just – it was not what he expected. And I, mean, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm too much to say. I, he hates his kids. Like, literally yeah. has – Oh, he can't tell them apart. Yeah, he has no – And one of, them, one of them, like, hurt him. Like, didn't he, like, get a shiner or something from one of his yeah. kids through the divorce? With one – and and in, in that own way too, that's also just like tragic. <laughs> that because he's he's <laughs> lost touch with the younger generation and with the younger part of himself, you know. Yeah. And so many people, I think that's where they do. I'm since I'm r slash child free, I think a lot of people do get that sort of childlike wonder by playing with their kids or talking to their kids and stuff. But if you can't get that. And you spent your entire life building up this factory, which what are they manufacturing? I don't even remember. Um, oh, shit. Whatever stuff, widgets. Um, yeah, it, it's and you lose touch with everything because he's gone again. He's gone too far in the direction of corporate life because to a teenager, like what is scarier to a lot of teenagers, not all of them, to certainly to a teenager like Max Rushmore. Um, what is scarier than like growing up to work in a factory, which is just this like industrial, corporate, stifling, Henry Fordian setting? Yeah, smoke and steel, 20th century, outdated. Um, it, it's symbolic of all that. It's a hell, think, it's a boundary. Think, uh, one aspect too, while well, we're kind of moving on from Max, but one thing that needs to be stated is that. Max is not only, you know, he, he he's a lot, blah, 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 but I think a core person, like his core character, at least at this point in his life, he's a chronic liar. He's a liar. He, he is like, I've never met a character in a movie that lies so, like, he lies about everything. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Adam Sandler and Uncut Gems. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe that. <laughs> it's, it's like, but it's like not just like denial. It's like lies that like you don't even need to lie. You know what I mean? He's like a pathological liar. I don't and know, Ben. I feel like you know he's trying to hot. He's insecure about a lot of things. He, he no, doesn't. No. He doesn't like that he's from a working class background. Oh no, hundred percent. I'm not saying that he's even in, in the wrong for it. I'm just saying he is like a. He's formed this like shell that like he is a pathological liar because of his insecurities and and his. His station in life too, you know what I mean. Yeah. But I just, I just noticed that, like, when I rewatched it yesterday, he really does. He lies about everything, in in places that he doesn't even need to lie. He lies, you know. Like, I just, I found that, I found that very 
peculiar just in the grand scheme of his character. I, uh, well, in school, kids would just say shit all the time, like, oh, I fucked your mom, you know, to be as crude as possible. But that's true. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, my dad works at Nintendo. My yeah. uncle works at Nintendo. <laughs> But also, like, I, I was very sheltered, and I was not allowed to do and watch things. And so I would feel left out when kids were talking about some... Very occasionally, they would be talking about, like, some new, new movie or, or something. Me too. I'd feel so left out that I would lie and say that I had seen it uh, just yeah. to feel included. Because I just, you know, felt that way. So I That's definitely I feel too. for them. Yeah. But... uh still I'm, liar though i still i still but he it's great that he comes to an understanding and appreciation of of where he comes from and his father being a barber and stuff like that yeah, and yeah dude that the scene where he's like i want you to meet my dad like whenever him and herman make up and no word just said herman's like fucking bill murray's face when he sees and he just like oh i, under, I get it all now I that look every- is my favorite bill murray dude. performance like ever that look, man, I like it makes me cry. Like I just, I fucking. It's so I, simple yet so complex. Just one. Like, right. I, I'd he, like to see the set, like what direction Wes Anderson gave him in that moment. Because yeah, and then and I, dad, I, I think Bill Murray probably is. You know, he's been doing this long enough by '98, '97. Um, he probably didn't need a lot of direction. I think he understood it. Yeah. I bet. Also, fun fact about just him understanding it. Uh, this movie was not going to get like he got paid nothing. He only got back ends. He said, I like this script so much that I want to help make this movie a thing. So he only took like the back. End. He didn't take a paycheck. Yeah, this is this is an incredibly lean script. We rewatching it and there's yeah. so many. It's it's very hard to balance having dialogue. That's stylized enough to be impactful. Um while still remaining naturalistic, but not so naturalistic that it becomes boring. And th- this, because so many characters do have quips or moments, um, but it doesn't take me out of it. Um, just, the- just things like when Rosemary Cross, Ms- Mrs. Cross, introduces Luke Wilson. Oh my wife. God, are you about to say the exact same line that I'm about to say? Say it. Oh, he's like, who are you? And then he- Whoa. What the hell happened? He this is, movie, this movie is cracking me up on this. So hey, uh, the, the internet, like, it paused you guys for like thirty seconds or something. Is it still recording? I need to. I need to get in a better habit of um recording. It's recording. Okay. Yeah. What were you saying about Luke Wilson? Just like it's this is a funny ass movie. He he was talking about the scene where Mrs. Cross like introduces like they're at, they're at dinner basically. Yeah. And uh, wh- what was the line that you said, Scott? It was uh. There's a few where he meets someone just like, "Who are you?" Yeah. And, yeah. and then later he says, "You know, they were like, what happened to you?'" And he's like, "I got hit. What's your excuse or something like that?" Yeah, just like being an well, asshole. And, and well, and Scott was like, I had the same scene on my mind. I had wrote in, in my notes. <clears throat> One of the funniest lines in the movie is whenever he he's talking to him, he turns to him and he's like, I like your nurse's uniform guy. And, and that, yeah, that that's They're OR like, scrubs. <laughs> yeah, this is the funniest fucking line read. Oh, are they? Yeah, dude. That's just Oh, like, are they? What that's a funny. bastard. What uh, a bastard. Dude. And it's just that's, that's like little... probably the most um uh, hard to watch scene of the whole movie, because like he in gets the restaurant little... after you mean, uh huh? In the restaurant, yeah, yeah. It's so cringy. Like... When they get, he gets a little drunk and he just starts acting like a prick, and it's like, yeah, it's of course, Bill show. Murray's character would get him fucking a little liquor. Like that's crazy to me. But uh, yeah, the whole core of the film is is Max <clears throat> being in love with his this teacher. Not even his teacher, just a teacher at the First school, Brushmore. And he figures out her husband died and that um, she's uh, it's been like a year. And I don't know. He's just completely crushing on her. And it's just like a boyhood crush. But it takes it to the insane extreme thing. Right. Delusional. How do you try to relate delusional? to her? Like, hey, both got dead people in our family. Yeah. Very, you- there's probably something edible about it. I don't 
care enough to go through a full oh, no, I, I analysis think, I think, right now. I think that's like a very. I, think, I don't think it's. I, don't know, I think it's an overtone. I think he misses his mother. I think he sees a mother. No, absolutely, absolutely. He, he is absolutely confusing sexual love with the love of a mother. Basically, that that is a. I think that's a hundred percent what's going on. Sure, I think. Yeah. I think honest as as we've all been fifteen year old boys. I think, yeah. um, <laughs> and it's hard to delineate those feelings sometimes when yeah. your hormones are going like crazy like that. You're like, yeah. wait, I, do, am I in love with this chick or am I just horny? Um, which fortunately dies down when you get older. I don't know if it ever goes away. I meet some guys who still can't tell. Um, I mean, the, well, the movie is it's very much like he wants, even though he has a loving dad, he wants a father figure that is rich, successful, blah, blah, blah. So he goes to Herman. He yeah. wants a mom that's just there. That's that's he wants his ideal mother, and that's definitely Mrs. Cross. It's very much like this weird found family that he is trying to achieve, basically. Even yeah. though the point is that he has a loving family, he has his mother, you know, he has these people. He doesn't even conflate these two emotions so hard. He he's like a Max is also like a very empathetic person, and he doesn't understand his emotions at all, you know. No, and a lot of people, I've been guilty of this, certainly in the past, um, when they don't understand their emotions, they'll go out to managing other people's emotions. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. Like, I don't know, I've had therapists who I found out were like divorced three times and stuff, and I'm like, oh, oh, okay, is this what you're doing? Is this where you're putting your energy into my fucked up ass? Um, also, I do want to say this. His dad is a neurosurgeon. His dad is a neurosurgeon. All right? The scene, we see a shift in Bill Murray's character where um, he does feel somewhat healed after the haircut. And his dad makes that quip like it's a painless procedure. Um, and often, you know, wardrobe or hair and makeup changes for a character obviously signify change. And that signifies a change where like he's crawling out of his depression and his misery and he's going to take action. So that haircut is symbolic of him being healed. That so is a great point. His dad yeah. is a neurosurgeon. Said it three uh, times. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome, dude. Wow. I like that um it showcases uh Max's naive understanding of things because just because Miss Cross has those fish tanks in her room, he assumes that she would want a whole aquarium and he fixates on this for the whole movie yeah and she read that, one jack Cousteau book yeah and it's like he takes it upon himself to jump into like an aquarium groundbreaking and that's like finally when it's like gone too far <laughs> bloom, and, uh, bloom spends eight million dollars on that no no that's at the end the first that's time the okay the first time the first time he, he takes it on himself and he's trying to get like part of the field uh to be for yeah. the and that's when that, the um Mr. uh or Dr. what's his name? Um Guggenheim Guggenheim it comes out and like expels him. But I love up until here, he has this kind of like I don't want to say smarmy, but you know, he has that composure of like I, I know what I'm doing at all times. And then we finally see him like snot nose crying all over his face and stuff breaking composure but it's done from like the outside window of like kids looking in i think that's a great decision to see him like that and that way like seeing it just like okay, he's, he's completely like, he's broken a fucking kid yeah he's a fucking kid who like yeah doing this shit you and know and he doesn't and emphasizes he doesn't want to show it to the world and then yeah. even at his new place he's trying to be like i'm gonna start a fencing club also, it's like depressing to see him in like that public school classroom, how sterile and boring it is compared to like the charm and detail and like the coziness of the private school. It yeah. kind of like makes me think of like how much more inviting certain teachers classrooms were as a kid, especially for like reading and enrichment and stuff and how other teachers just didn't give a fuck. And it was so empty and lifeless. No, it is important. Although I, if I ever decorated my own classroom, I'm not good at decorating, so I don't know what it'd be. Just like movie posters on the wall, I guess. Um, the I, I also want to say I noticed sitting, I guess stage left. Um, so 
from our viewpoint to his right is Alexis Bladell from Gilmore Girls. I recognize her in the front row. Oh, dude, yeah, yeah, there, yeah, you're right. That is, <clears throat> that's funny. Yeah, she's like, she's like, just like in it as a background character. Yeah, as an extra, but it's Alexis Bladell. Oh, we haven't, uh, we haven't really talked about this. Is the way Wes has always been good at it, but like the way he's able to just like make his worlds feel alive, like whether it be set design or locations but specifically in this one like the the characters that are like they kind of just like live in this movie like mr guggenheim or fucking dirk calloway man fucking yeah. number one guest boy right there dude <laughs> yeah. fucking, fucking dude like whenever max is like yeah i fucked his mom and you're just like what the fuck like and, you know and, and dirk's like i like i can't remember what he says but he says something that's so like just like you need to grow up, get the fuck out of here, type of thing. I can't remember, I can't remember what he says, but it's just like yeah, crap. the younger kid, smaller kid. Yeah, it, it, they're not in the same grade, are they? No, there's no way. So. No way. There's no way. No also, way. when He's just little like Toadie, yeah. I I laugh so hard though because this again shows the child understanding of the adult world of uh when Dirk writes the letter and he says Bloom and Miss uh Cross and Cross. We're just giving each other hand jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's all it, that's probably hey. the only sexual term he knew because he had just heard it from the other guys at school. Yeah. Right. Right. Um well, and, see, and, and as a kid, the hand jobs like sounds great. And as an adult, yeah. it's like I don't even want in a to pool, work. yeah. A hand job in a pool, great. Yeah, have yeah. fun. Yeah. But, and so yeah. also I'll thing. probably get one of those little Amazon fish that swim up your urethra. I'm sorry, Dylan. What were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> Before I started talking about parasites, dude, fuck you, Scott. Bong Joon Ho. Anyway. anyway, yeah, I'm gonna have to like, I'm gonna have to clear my mind of what you just said. Uh, not just Dirk, but like even uh the fucking bully Magnus, where he, at the very end he's like, I always wanted to be in one of your fucking plays, yeah. and it's like, it's like, yeah, dude, everyone, everyone is going through their own shit. No one, no one feels like just a character that doesn't exist whenever they're not on screen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause I like, cause like, I like that Dirk has like planned this rock invasion, like with his friends behind the trees, like waiting for him and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Like, Isn't a wizard costume, like lightning bolt. Lightning yeah. bolt. <laughs> I think cause it was Halloween, but yeah, it was, it was Halloween. Yeah. still funny though. But, uh, and I like the Mangus is like, just an annoying prick. And also I empathize with Max wanting to impress or or say something that will get a bully off of your ass. So I do understand him wanting to look cool and saying like, oh, I got a hand job in the back of a Jaguar. <laughs> it's like kids say stupid shit like that all the time. Like, what are you fucking talking about? Oh, I, I, I had a 15 year old on the bus once tell me when I was in sixth grade that he had a threesome with lesbian twins and turned them yeah. and they were like making out with each other like sh- kids just make shit up yeah. well now you gotta give you gotta watch what you say now dude you might have an investigation on your ass dude you start spouting off shit about your teacher or something well mm-hmm. i haven't i haven't had a sex with lesbian twins oh yeah well all right say it again what have you had scott say not what? sex with lesbian twins okay just making sure, <laughs> making sure. i want to clear for the record yeah, I like that. Um, oh. <laughs> it's like we get this moment where we realize Bill Murray is all he sees something in Miss Cross as well, and he thinks maybe that could be something he needs at that moment. He sees ne- youth, neither sees him nor pussy. Max need Mrs. Cross, they just don't realize it. And now, no, I need Mrs. Cross. Yeah, now they're in like a almost like a prank war, except it escalates too hard. Like he's a grown man crushing this kid's bike with his car, and it's like, you know, he's but he's lost the plot. Like he's it's lost. insecure. Yeah, like it's yeah, it's lost the plot, dude. What are you doing, dude? But also, yeah. like, it makes him feel young, probably doing these kinds of things. But yeah. Max, of course, is insane and cuts his brakes, and he almost crashes at the fucking school. Like, what the fuck? But that's the, they at least pair it with the realistic ending of of max like getting arrested and having to go be be picked up from jail (laughs) like yeah but that also brings up the idea of well the whole thing about his father doesn't push him one way or another 
and I'm wondering because you know, Max says maybe I should be focusing a little more on school and like I'm too spread out with these uh, activities. And his dad's kind of like, yeah, maybe so. But he never does gives him like never really forces him to do anything. I feel like maybe what kind of structure does Max actually need from his father? Yeah, is that he- is the thing that Max's father is clearly like a good person and a good dad. But there is, yeah, like a, what is the relationship really? You know what I mean? I think after do we do we know how old because uh, it's an older dad. But do we know how old the mom was or how old Max was when his mom died? So, he was seven or eight, I think. A okay. Plot, a plot of her, yeah, her headstone says she died in 1989. And you know, this movie came out, what, 1995? Yeah, it's set in 97. It's so. set in 97. Yeah. And Max is like 15. Yeah, he's probably eight. Yeah, eight, nine, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um. Something must have happened parental wise, just where. Well, I, a lot of times in, in real life, um, a single parent they might dote on their kid because now all their love and energy you know this is all they have and they might do that or i even know uh, of a childhood friend i don't really talk to him anymore but later you know i in a teen teen years or something he had these really bad health problems um that were like kind of life-threatening and he got over them and he's fine yeah but his mom like doted on him too much after that because she was like you're not dead, uh, basically. So those those things happen. Yeah, totally. I just um, I, there is that scene where his dad does say he's like, "Look, Max, I like being a barber, but you've talked about being like in the Senate and shit like that." And uh, I don't know, just a, a little bit of a, a an idea, like a nudge, but I don't know. Um, he needed a little more structure, but. I don't know. He he's such a but, but Wes natural. Anderson turned out all right. Yeah, he's just a naturally born leader. He's good at leading and 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 figuring things out for yeah, education. Like, yeah, he speaks and then people will listen to him. Yeah, yeah. charisma's hard to teach. It's yeah, insane. And, and we have. see the effects of that at the very end when you see just how many people he got to come to the play at the end. It's like, how does yeah. he finagle all this it's crazy oh uh, and you know play that's ever been a school play dude yeah i like think it was just 90 minutes of action like there's no real plot yeah and he saves latin he figures out that she found latin to be romantic and so he after dissing latin gets it saved and not only does he get it saved it's now mandatory for all grades 7 through 12 to take it yeah which is ridiculous by the way yeah that's insane it's a dead language. I don't know. You can argue having a Latin base helps you with the romance languages, but also just like learn some Spanish and that'll get you Let's say like, dude, the hop from Spanish to Italian to French. Like just getting that first step. You don't have to learn Latin. Portuguese you can have. Yeah, yeah dude, I can do I can have I can like halfway read Portuguese. I'm like, ah, this looks kind of like I don't know what to do with the C's with the little tails, like they're like nah. but um you know, yeah. uh, but also like it's a waste of time to study anything other than English. Yeah, sure. I was thinking when I watched it last night, uh, Miss Cross, she reminds me. I can't. What's the actress I haven't pulled up on? It's uh, Olivia Williams. Yeah, Olivia Williams. And I don't know if I've really ever seen her in anything else, but she reminds me a lot of Mini Driver and Good Will Hunting. They have a very mm-hmm similar. It's not just because they're British, but like they have this like very similar kind of like really empathetic openness that that i, I just i found it last night because i also rewatched google hunting a few nights ago they were very I've been mean to rewatch that dude you should at the age you are at now yeah it is it, it i haven't seen it since it, i was 16 exactly it'll, it'll ruin you in, in a good way uh but yeah they, they have a very similar uh, kind of thing about them i just i i found it funny no there there's a okay i hate this word i i hate this word but they're both kind of empaths, you know. Sure. No, definitely, and they're all, and I think it's also just like the academic setting of, of mm. both the movies. But yeah, they are there, and they're both beautiful and British. We'll also have that. And, and she they, um, really, they have really nice voices. I could hear them talk. The very soft. Yeah, he probably cast her because of her motherly kind of voice and nature. Definitely. Yeah, she 
she's like what supposed to be like what mid 20s maybe late 20s in this movie yeah. and she actually and she, yeah she feels like a fucking mid i want her to read me to sleep like yeah. i think she's beautiful i'm not even making sex jokes i want her to stroke my hair and read me and tell me too. everything's gonna be okay yeah <laughs> And or totally. read, read me Robert Louis Stevenson. She was reading her <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like what I like. It's about she knows how to talk to Max. She thinks at least like as, as any rational grown up would. And it's just still not good enough. And yet when we get to like, you know, she talks to him as you would talk to a 15 year old boy. But the other dynamic, what I find is fun is when it's Max and and Herman, it's very much like almost like it's just two adults with like this serious, complicated drama, but it's actually a 15 year old and like a 55, 60 year old man. And they're both delusional and they're both acting childish. But it's just funny because when, when um, he figures out that they hit cross and, and Herman are, are what they were holding hands, taking a walk, which is what Dirk saw. Um, he like waits in the back of Herman's car is like sitting back there, like waiting and shit. And then they like <laughs> argue like, this is like, um, it could almost be like, I don't know, like a crime movie or something, the way they're arguing and talking, but yeah. it's just like this 15 year old dumb Dude. kid. Cause he's watched. Cause in one of the plays he remakes is Serpico, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because he, <laughs> you want to know an actual inspiration, like a heavy inspiration for this movie. And you're never going to fucking. West Serp- well, yeah, in many ways, but heat. Oh, okay. Really? Okay. Yeah. With the way that Paul, the way that uh, De Niro and Pacino's characters are kind of like, that's what he was going for. That's what for. it feels like. Yeah. 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 Rivalry. He was going for it with Herman and, yeah, dude, it's, it's that's crazy. That's why it works. And it works because, like, it's played straight. It's all rooted in real emotion, but it's just yeah. it's the situational comedy is all there. Yeah. It, it's very much, yeah, he was going for, like, Harold and Maude. And heat. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. And it, it, this movie does. I've been thinking about this a lot the past few months. Um, because I, I do think obviously it, Max Rushmore is Wes Anderson, and he's into plays and he's into movies. Um, and he's that obviously is affected because a lot of times that's your only view into the adult world is through fiction or you know whatever. Um, and I do think how many people in general have had their perception of romance or perception of love, um, altered by movies and and by Hollywood a ton. I think, I mean, even the idea of romance is like kind of a 20th century. I mean, there's courtship, there's romance. Yeah. 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 But like it courtship and what it has been has evolved so much over centuries. Summer's about like a to- like the opening scene is like a total misreading of the movie The Graduate, and that's what the fucking movie is about. Is how yeah, if you watch the movie and you got all your fucking notions of love and shit from it, and you totally misread it. Wait, and does he misread The Graduate in the first scene? Yeah. Oh yeah, wow. yeah. The whole, the whole thing is that yeah, he's like he believed in love, blah blah blah, and then he watched the movie The Graduate and totally misread it. I somehow missed that. I don't know why. Plus, um, also, the opening and closing of the films are a curtain opening and a curtain closing. So Yeah. That's like, yeah. You know. Because, yeah, I mean, he still shoots in, on stages, but it's very blatant in this one. Um, which, why is that? Is he? Is it just an affect? Is, is he just presenting it as its own world, emphasizing the fictionality of it? Yeah, I think that's like the, the. I think that's one of the things of like, oh, I see what you're gonna do later in movies. Yeah, it's I, definitely that. I see what you're about to do. Well, if it, yeah, if it's if it's him being Max, then Max puts on these plays, so it's him commenting yeah. on that. Yeah, it's, it's him saying, "Hey, this is me putting on a play for you, and I'm Max." Yeah. Um, that's so what a what a fucking movie that like simultaneously like takes you out of it, but still, you know what I mean. Where it, I, the way he's able to balance like he balances it more than most. A lot of like Brechtian sort of taking you out of the movie um, on purpose type of thing. You, you on know what purpose, I, mean? I understand yeah. why in the post war period it was radical, but now I find it you know like a lot of postmodernism, just kind of like I get the point, but now tell me a story. Um, yeah. And I, an ironic for ironic sake, I, right? Yeah, um, sure. that's so. Ugh. Can't stand it. 
I don't know, even even going to and this is one of the scenes I definitely re- remembered well um, from watching this years and years ago is when he has fake blood on him and he goes through the window of uh, Rosemary's house, which is such a say anything boombox at the window movie stupid thing to do. Because that's something uh, a 15 year old would think would be romantic. Yeah, this movie. I, speaking of that scene, this movie does a really good job too of balancing just how creepy that is. You know what I mean? Or like, like how they, they navigate her character as like she clearly loves him in a way that is like maybe even a little bit like I do. I see you as a person, but they they balance it so well of like no, <laughs> fuck you, fuck no, this is not right. You know well, what I mean? Yeah, we're at a point though where like. Max is kind of ruining people's lives because she <laughs> res- she resigns from Rushmore uh, during like the conflict between after after uh, Herman's cars like uh, almost crashes and all this stuff and that she realizes that they're fighting over her and like all this stuff she leaves the school like that bums me out and like he does he yeah he's because he's a fucking child. But that's such an important scene when he comes in, when she's packing and she's like, fuck this. I'm going to treat you what you like you think you are. And she starts like saying, what are you going to fuck me? You're going to finger me like starts using explicit terms. And suddenly he's like turned on his head. I think that's such an important scene for him. Yeah. The blocking that scene is so good when he's backed in literally backed into the corner pipe and sneaks. Yeah. He's like. That sounds a bit cheap, and she's the only if you've never had it. Um, yeah, fuck. Only if you've never had that sex. Which is, I mean, and I do think that's one thing that makes it less creepy is that he's clearly not doing this for sexual reasons. He's yeah. not. He he wants to be in love with her, um, and he thinks he's in love with her because he thinks that's he thinks love and obsession are the same thing, which is yeah. what movies teach you: is that love and um, obsession. And, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for when you're falling in love? Infatuation yeah. is all the same thing when it's not. I, I think what I mean too is just, you know, we're in 2024, it's a different time. And you sometimes you watch older movies that maybe attempt to have some type of weird dynamic like that. And you're like, oh my God. Like yeah. what I thought was like fine whenever I was like a kid is what fucking weird. And then, yeah, you like you rewatch this and it's like so clear on what is going on. It's such a good representation of how people can have feelings like that in a school setting and also like how to actually navigate that and say hey no fuck you <laughs> like this you, is not do you guys have any crushes on teachers growing up dude fuck yeah oh you my did? god not really a lot shout out to uh my English teacher in 10th grade dude she had like the fattest ass i wanted to <laughs> I, want... I was talking more of like an emotional crush not just no no no, no. no, no not me. Actually, all my teachers were never... frumpy she uh this teacher was actually, even though she had a big ass, I actually, she was like, really <laughs> and she like got me into like reading. And so like, I really had, I had a crush on her. Oh, so. well, you know, that's a, uh, I don't know. I wonder if that's, this is, this is going to sound like a joke, but it's not. I wonder if being like an attractive teacher, like the joke in movies normally is like, it distracts the students and they're like, huh, I wasn't paying attention. But I wonder if it actually makes you more engaged with what they're saying. I literally will. Yeah, I would do things like, "Hey, can you come over here and like tell me about this?" So I <laughs> it could be like, just like, just such a, I'm serious, dude. I was that fucking like 13, 14 year old. <laughs> like, like, hey, I, I'm reading fucking reading Count of Monte Cristo. Can you tell me what this means? Yeah, and, you read Count of Monte Cristo in school? That's cool. Yeah, really we read a lot. She was she was a really cool literature English teacher. Hmm. Yeah, I know. God, looking back, I have so many problems with the English curriculum because I, I will. OK, so I have worked in education. I've worked with students. I've been kind of like a teaching assistant, paraprofessional um, run classes while I'm in there. But under the supervision of a real teacher, uh, I will. I was thinking the whole time of it's just one of those things when you work in an educational setting you and you've been an educator and you look at the educator's character and how uncomfortable this would be. Um, and I was thinking like. Okay, it would be a little cute if I wasn't thinking of fifteen, but uh, I, I never taught that age anyway. But if like a, if like an eleven year old girl like had a crush on me or something, like there'd be a part of it that was like a little cute. Um, I, I will say right now that never happened, and I've never kissed a fifteen year old child. <laughs> um, let me clarify that here. Okay. <laughs> um, You're getting into weird. But also, it's it's like it's such. 
like, and this is something I legitimately struggle with with teaching because it's like you have to be an authority figure, but like at the same time, maybe because I had so much trouble in school emotionally, like you really have to watch out for your kids' well being, you know, emotionally and and intellectually. And so, like, what do you do in a situation like that? It's terrible. And I'll be honest, I would have thrown that kid out of my life i would have been if that kid showed up on my doorstep i would have called the freaking cops i would have shot him i don't know i would have gone full you would have shot him. yeah i would have shot him yeah mr gun control max scott Rushmore, Keith. Yeah, yeah there'd be some real blood yeah max rush my roommate has guns he hunts i could just go in there and i could figure out his safe no but it, it, there's like it's gross that he fakes this injury that he was run over just to get inside of her house. And then imme- immediately cops to it being fake when she asks. Yeah. But also, there's the important part where she kind of hears what she needed to hear. And that it's like, yeah, she's been sitting in her husband's room surrounded by his stuff constantly. Which is which is such like, normally you hear that and it's parents leave their kid's room when their kid dies at war or something. Yeah. yeah. But... What the well, that's why, this is why this is such a good movie is that we're talking about these these relationships are so complicated they are so fucked up and not not normal and yet it, it's a movie that is true and real and also fucking hilarious you know and that's what you know we're always talking about now like media literacy is dead dude fucking I, I showed this I can't imagine someone watching this right now someone that's younger I, w- I would like to know what they would think. You know, just like the Gen Z brain rot, which I'm not trying to be a boomer right now, but you know what I mean? Where it's like... But aren't I you kind of Gen Z? I think yeah. I'm... A- you are. You and my fiance are both... Uh, we're, me and Scott are like... I'm a... Technically, by my date of birth, I'm a Zillennial. Oh, and really? Then, and then Scott's like a- the youngest millennial there is. I think yeah. I'm a Zillennial. I don't know. I don't know. Either you might way. be a zillennial. You're a little Gen Z. I don't know, man. I've seen your. I've seen the way you dress. I'm listen. All I've I'm seen your Instagram. I'm not. I'm not. I haven't I'm, seen your TikTok because I don't have TikTok because I'm a millennial. I'm not. I'm not claiming to not be that, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Where it's like, you fucking every day I, I do. I get on TikTok and fucking some young person is like saying this movie is like problematic because I don't know fucking five. A person is like two years too old for somebody. You know what I mean? It, 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 people yeah. don't want to engage. But people anymore. just need to leave Woody Allen alone. <laughs> okay. <Dude>. No, but <laughs> I, I have to remind myself constantly, like a lot of these TikTok people are 16, 17, 18 years old. And they yeah, a have- lot, a lot of the discussion, who has the time to craft lengthy posts on the internet on Reddit or TikTok, whatever teenagers Adults aren't doing that. Usually. I comment no, on a lot of TikToks. All right, well, adults aren't doing that though. But you're the Kino Cowboy. That's I do cool. argue with probably teenagers on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Dude, wait, a little side tangent. Dude, I will be scrolling my TikTok and I'll just like watch a video and then I'll fucking pull up the comments and you're there like arguing with somebody. I'm like, yeah. what the fuck? Because you guys have the same algorithm. Can you have friends on TikTok? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's why. Yeah, always like accidentally sends me random shit that he doesn't want to send me. It's I hilarious. will. Uh, yeah, like a fucking 80 year old grandpa, I will nod off. <laughs> and like somehow my thumb hits shit and it sends stuff to Dylan. It's like the most like lame, normie kind of like shit. And I'm like, how did this even get sent to him? Like, probably because you're a lame normie. Uh, yeah, no, sometimes really stuff comes up on your face. Give me that crown. The, the, the veil is gone. We know it. You're just a fucking normie. Uh, you know what I mean, though. It's just Dude. like... He he started this podcast and found a bunch of movies. Like He's like, what can make me look not like a normie and look patrician? <laughs> yeah, Let's do okay. it in black and white. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Black and white's artsy. Uh, that, uh, Triumph of the Will was in black and white. I that do was- think about all the movies you would have just never watched if we didn't do this show, and it like, kind of bums me out. Like Phantom of the Paradise, and like just all kinds yeah, of classics. Who me? Yeah. For- you too. Like me. You want to watch? Just saying. Like it's, it's it's cool that we like. I can show you all my favorite shit. I didn't watch Phantom of the Paradise, by the way. I wasn't on. Oh, that. okay. Well, that see, there you go. You missed out. Yeah, well, you know, I need to watch it. I watch other stuff. I watch Kino when I'm off the clock. <laughs> like uh, Challengers, which we can't get into right now. But 
No. Oh. <laughs> I didn't want to name drop that because I knew Dylan would be like, God damn you. Yeah, that movie, oh. that movie rules. <laughs> but um look, he even ha- he even has the tennis shorts for it. Yeah. Let's go play some fucking tennis, dude. <laughs> Don't you play tennis? Yeah, I-, I have played tennis. Yeah, not as much as soccer, but you play tennis. Yeah, I did play tennis. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's amazing when any movie with sports or any physical activity I can relate to on any level. <laughs> yeah, that movie is good. We don't have time. Oh shit! But it keeps going. It any, just keeps any, going. Any more on 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 Rushmore though that we have? Yes, I I just want, I did want to point out that it's funny that like Max, like his presence alone. Brings back Doctor Guggenheim from back from his stroke enough to be like, "What the fuck <laughs> yeah. do you want?" That is the one of the funniest bits that he annoys Doctor Guggenheim so much that he fucking wills him back to life. It's like, almost it's almost like in a different. It's kind of like a revenge epic. It's like a John Wick thing, like how revenge and hate will power you through anything. It's <laughs> it's the same. It's the same thing. Guggenheim is John Wick, is what I'm saying. What, what, what is it? What, what is it that line where he's like, he seems like a smart kid. And he's like, he's the worst student we've got. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is just like one of the funniest fucking lines, dude. Oh, it's, so be, it's, it's, uh, it happens. I've had that before where I've had like kids who were clearly smart, who just don't give a crap. And I'm like, what? I'm like, come on, dude. Yeah. Well, he's just a brilliant kid just, just in his own way. way. It's like, he just doesn't know how, like he doesn't, you know what I mean? Like he doesn't know how to apply himself at all. But I'm, he's so good at specific things because he's in public school for like two weeks and he's already like uh t- like team captain of the cheerleading team and he's like setting up all these different <laughs> classes and stuff and he's already leading these public school kids around the hall and stuff. Just he's like, a director. Yeah, man. Yeah. Good, very good director. And I like that. He does take time to do just like kid stuff. Like he flies that kite with Dirk, and then uh, he oh. sees uh, what's her name Yang. Uh, first Every name she's Margaret. Got, yeah, she's got similar interests and stuff, and it's just enough to remind him that um, yeah, you should probably be going for that girl your age. <laughs> even he, she, you know, he learns. You know, even the poor kids have something to offer me. <laughs> also, dude. <laughs> can't be understood he's a fucking asshole to margaret yes a fucking asshole and she's still she can she's a teenage girl and but she can also understand that like oh that's not how he is clearly like he's not like that i can so, fix him no she she probably understands that like something is not right there with him hurt people hurt people yeah and and i, I do love it in so few words too it's very much like i get it I'll stand here and watch you fly your kite. Can I do it too? You know what I mean? Like it's such a childish way to do it, but it's so pure and wonderful. I love it. It's there. There's also said something to be in, in terms of out on courtship of just waiting it out of just like, you will yeah. like, you'll, you'll realize that you like me eventually. If I just stay in here long enough, because <laughs> I know you do, you, you don't know yet, but you, you do. <laughs> I, I think, I think it's very, yeah, I think it's very much that like, I can see that you, that you're supposed to be. So yeah. I'll so I'll be there for it whenever it happens, you know. Yeah. And, and I, I do I, I I think it's a very sweet in a movie that's not really about I guess it's kind of a romance movie, but you know it's really a coming of age movie. But that little sweet romance, I think it was a perfect kind of end cap to his arc as a person. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Ah, yeah, it's wonderful. I I love that. It's so I'll, sweet. I like how um. They start, they put away, him and Herman put away their differences and start hanging out and doing stuff together uh, and preparing. And he, he convinces him to do the $8 million aquarium <laughs> breaking ground. And then she doesn't even show up. And he's like, what the fuck? Um, but that was good for him to realize like, okay, I, I did this whole thing and she's still not going to come back. A lot more expensive than therapy, although yeah, although but, quicker. But they maybe. do share that um that nice coffee outside of the intermission during the play at the end. So, you know, um, 
and it may have been a scheme for him to have them sit next to get each other at the play, but he wasn't oh, doing definitely. that. Whole, he wasn't doing that whole play just so that would happen. But no, I, it, I think he kind of was, dude. I think everything was because he. It's also like his core traits are like he's a liar, but that's you know informed by his trauma, his grief, his insecurities. Yeah, not even just a, a liar, a bullshitter. Go on. Yeah, he's a bullshitter, but he's also a manipulator. He does. He manipulates yeah. everything he can. And the way it kind of, the movie kind of flips it is that at the end, he does manipulate everyone to do something, but in yeah. a way that's positive. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I do get that. Totally. You use your powers I, I, for good. Yeah, I do. <laughs> he did. He used his powers for good. I do think he intended everything to happen. Just like Wes is so meticulous with everyone needs to be blah, 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 blah. That's how Max is. That's where that I think the West part of Max's character really comes through of like Wes is in his own way, like a manipulator. You know, he, he needs everything to be where it's supposed to be. It's a, uh, you know, like a term in cooking is a mise en, mise en place, which like everything in its right place. That's, sure. that's very much what he, uh, what, what his character is. And I, I, I do see Wes in that, you know, does that make it his most personal film or what What would you argue is his most personal film? I think for the West that made that movie that. Oh, I, I think Asteroid City might still be his most personal film, but that's just like a totally different type of personal. You yeah. know what I mean? Two different parts of his life. Like, this yeah, was, that, that, that's a, a this was Asteroid. in his 20s and now he's in his 50s, you know? Yeah. And, and not even just the age difference. It's that. He based an entire character. I mean, I'm sure there's Wes and a lot of or most of his characters, but I feel like I have never seen a character quite as like particularly like in very specific ways like Wes. You know what I mean? Very yeah. specifically in Avatar. Yeah, since since Rushmore. I think yeah, I think he needed true. to do that movie. I think he wrote what he knew, basically. That's that's kind of, you know, what they say is like write what you know. And then you can start going off from there. I think that's what he kind of did of like, he wrote what he knew, which was himself, his life there in Texas. You know, it's, it's, it's very much, and it's very much an autobiography, you know? And I think uh, Asteroid City is very much not him as a person, but his, uh, his feelings within the world around him, which, you know, we have, to plug it, we, yeah, we do have a video essay about it. It's actually really good. Yeah, go check that out if you want more. We, video, we did a Royal Tenenbaum cast episode. We we have that video essay, like Dylan said, and then we have this episode. So uh, we got some Wes Anderson stuff out there. If you're interested in more from us about him, um, yeah. What, did you have something to say, Scott, or no? No. Uh, since Dylan's on here, how was Star Wars Episode One theaters? How was that? <laughs> Dude, I was worried that. Uh, oh, did you see it too, Dylan? Oh yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah, you know, fucking. Are you shitting me, dude? Come on now. <laughs> my whole entire being on this, like half of my presence on this channel is just Star Wars bullshit. Like, how, <laughs> how the fuck do you think I wouldn't go see that? No, I was actually really worried because the theater was packed when I got my ticket. And I was like, oh, God, it's going to be a bunch of shitheads being like, oh, you know, laugh. You know, you see the videos of people just like cheering and laughing. And I hate that shit. I hate it so much. Yeah, I hate it when people are happy. Yeah, I hate it when people are. Well, also just like, I want to watch the movie. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, no, everybody needs to be stoic and watch I it. Didn't really, I didn't really mind it with Phantom Menace because it was like some kids talking and stuff. They'd never, some of them I could tell had never seen the movie. So it didn't bother me really. Well, that's what, okay. So that being said, it was actually a great theater experience. It was, everyone was, you know, laughing appropriately. Not, you know, it just, you see fucking shit of like people being like, yeah, Jar Jar. Or like, you know, doing like memes. Were and people shit. laughing at Jar Jar? No, they were laughing in the right ways. Yeah. Now, see, that's what I brought up to Scott is like seeing Phantom Menace in a mostly packed theater and having every single Jar Jar bit just go flat was really funny because it was just like dead silence. Oh, except for one. Bits. Except for oh, one. Yeah. yeah. When he Dude, steps in funny. shit, my mom laughed and no one else did. Oh, that's funny. My theater, people were kind of digging Jar Jar. And it, it wasn't like younger kids. It was younger kids, but it was also people like my age and older. I don't know. There's a weird, like, I'm not saying Phantom Menace is a good movie. I don't think it is. But the, 
there is like a, a really good earnestness to everything in it. There is like something that should be said about like, I don't know. It's not funny. The jokes don't really work, but I don't know. Something was attempted. <laughs> All right, it's but who's going to fight Jar Jar or Binks or Max Rushmore? Dude, Max Rushmore will fucking he'll he'll end Jar Jar with his words. I don't know. Yeah. He doesn't even need to... somebody's finger off during the rehearsal of the other play. Okay, there's I have nothing else to say about this movie, and I'm just doing bits now. There's this moment where Amandala is pretty serious about what's going on with her planet, and Jar Jar's talking to her next to the window, and he's serious too. I'm like, this is the only serious scene with Jar Jar. If they could have like used this as like an example, like he could have still been a little weird goofy if if he could have been toned down to this level it would have been amazing because he really works because he's like you know my people are warriors or misa people or whatever he says but it's just like i forget that scene is in the movie that, yeah that's what i really pay attention to also like the a lot of the cgi establishing shots of naboo and the uh senate look great even today uh Listen, the CGI looks great. The only thing that doesn't, oh my god, dude. I wish he would have chosen a different type of setup for that the Gungan battle. It looks like a fucking Windows 95 screensaver. It yeah, looks it does. terrible. It does not look good, man. And I I, I hate that because that like that's one of the things that he was so like pumped to do was do that battle sequence. Yeah, god, let's have like early that. CG in the broadest, most basic daylight. Dude, it looks so bad. It looks so fucking bad. It was interesting. And, and I hate the way, which I like, I got what he was going for because I like that, you know, you're cutting between three different battles, but holy shit, every single time it would go from Darth Maul and Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan fighting to fucking that bullshit. I, I wanted to jump out of my seat and die. I know you're just like, let me watch the Gungans. What's with all this? It would have been interesting to have. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> but the, the Starfighter I, shit. I, I was... hate Scott that you did this. Now we're just talking about Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> the starfighter sequence with anakin in space with that uh with that um trade federation ship that looks incredible in oh, 4k dude, it, looks so good. it looks so good i was really shocked does. by how well that holds up but um yeah. the uh the the best hey, part of the whole, racing yeah yeah the, the whole the best part of the whole thing was like there was this group of kids behind us with their families and clothes some of them had not seen this movie, I don't think, because when the Earth Maul ignites his second lightsaber, one kid went, yeah, got, "Whoa!" Yeah, and I was like, I "Wow, know, this kid, kid had no idea." No, yeah, they were like, great. and it got ruined for us through all the uh, TV spots and stuff. Yeah, it was in the trailer. Yeah, yeah. No, they were clearly people who had never seen the first one, and yeah, that that moment also, like, whatever he fucking lights that second part of his lightsaber, people they were, like, there was, like, an audible, like, I was like, oh, nice, nice, people are getting hyped from Star Wars, I love that feeling, hell yeah. And I understand why you can't, like, they haven't had that prequels level of lightsaber dueling, because it was the Jedi at the top of their power, so it makes sense for those movies, but like it still makes me miss it, and like I miss that technical of like lightsaber battles. It's just more thrilling than yeah. like well, some of the heavy-handed of... stuff because they in the new ones they actually have the blades illuminating light, so they cut down on how much lighting they have to put digitally in the film. I like, hate they do that now. I, I hate, hate it because it detracts from the actual what they can do. Also, it makes the lightsabers look like plastic toys. Like they don't yeah. look, right. they don't look right anymore. It's weird. Okay, but speaking of that, like the technical shit, <clears throat> did you say and watch the? Uh, <laughs> did, you, did you stay? <laughs> did you stay and watch the acolyte scene after? I did. <laughs> what did you think of it? It just looked like gobbledygook. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that overprocessed digital oh. image. <laughs> shit it's, that you know you didn't fuck with trinity and her lightsaber i couldn't even tell you who that is from the matrix no trinity from the matrix oh from that was Bible? her oh okay yeah that was trinity the father son and holy ghost all with lightsaber. that's cool but um i don't know 
Oh man, I love that. I just it never it never ceases to happen. If I come on this goddamn podcast, oh no, I I planned it. I planned all of talk it. about Star Wars. Oh, yeah, well, I'm gonna put this episode to where it has it like segmented, where you can look at the <laughs> bar, you know, so they can see like, oh, why is the last 20 minutes about Phantom Menace? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'm fully Andor pilled, so like everything else. Oh yeah, well that's why we don't talk about that shit. <laughs> You guys watch Fallout? Fallout was good. I didn't drag this out. Fallout was okay. Yeah, I played the game, so I'm like four episodes into Fallout. I haven't been completely wowed by it. I'm into the games. I I was like, I was like fighting to continue. I was like, do I really care about this? Yeah, I'm gonna check out the fourth episode. I did like the fourth episode, but it's just like TV shows these days. They have to be really good for me to keep watching. Oh, I get you. I, I I was dig- I dug the story, but man, just like the visual part of it, it just looked like shit. Dude. I didn't think it looked like shit. Also, here's the thing: everybody uh, complains about this. Dude, I'm, o- I'm, o- I'm okay with the TV show looking like a TV show. I I'm not when it costs fucking fifteen million dollars an episode. Yeah, like it. It, it, just, it was so flat. Like, dude, yeah. it, go watch fucking Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Another fuck. That's an amazing TV show. That looks like a fucking movie every single fucking episode. I think we're ge- you're giving too much leeway to these giant megacorps wasting millions of dollars. Maybe yeah. I don't know. I don't know anything about VFX though. <laughs> it just looked really flat. I really, I really did like the story, but it looks so flat. I, I hated looking at that show. It did not. I didn't like any part of it. I love Walton Goggins. Him as the ghoul was great. He's great. But, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I like it. I just don't love it. But um. I don't know. I feel like you spend 150 million on a show, it can if look. If you want to watch a better. show that spends like 150 million per episode type shit, or 50 million per episode, go watch Shogun. It's the best fucking show I've seen. I've been meaning to. Yeah, and it looks good. I saw the first episode. Fucking years, dude. It, it is actually incredible. It it feels like you know you know the heyday of TV of like Mad Men, Breaking Bad, True Detective. Game of like the early Game of Thrones where it was just like this is prime time TV type shit. That's what Shogun is. Yeah. It's... I don't like reading subtitles though. <laughs> yeah, I don't like I don't like other cultures. Yeah, other yeah. I don't watch Asian movies. <laughs> yeah, dude, I don't like that shit. Hey. It, it makes me scared. No European movies. Maybe <laughs> Australian since they speak kind of the same language. Yeah. Kind of. Are you boycotting Furiosa? Oh boy, did you read Edgar Wright's talking about that movie? Oh my god. Ed- Ed- Edgar Wright said, because there's one apparently in the middle of the film, there's one set piece that's like 20 minutes and took him 77 days to shoot or something. Yeah. And and during that, yeah. Edgar Edgar's just turned to his friend and was like, How'd they do that? How 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 yeah. George Miller's 80. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I want George Miller to like, you know. He's an old man. I hope he lives a little bit longer, but I want him to his dying days just make more Mad Max, which I know he said he has a script for a prequel to Fury Road. Like, make more Mad Max. I, I, I'm I, sure this is going to be great. I really hope we get the Wasteland. I, I thought you were going to say what I was thinking is I want uh, George Miller to be my dad because I do. I want George he Miller did. to block and direct my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I just ride in on a motorcycle throwing Molotovs at <laughs> I want George Miller to do that, but I want George Miller to be to do my wedding, but also I want him to be the George Miller that did Babe. Oh, okay. <laughs> not, yeah. not- I want George Miller to be in my wedding, and I want him to be the bride. Okay. I want to yeah. marry him. Dude, I'll kiss him on the mouth. Take his money, because, you know, how, how how much longer does he have? Well, I was, th- I was seeing that, like... Okay. Most everyone's early responses were like, "Wow, this movie is awesome! It's great!" And then one or two people were like, "Well, it's it's like it's not a nonstop thrill ride, not like one chase, like different movie." Fourth one, like yeah, it's. I would it be like three roads. It's, it's yeah. going to be a completely different movie. That's okay. And uh, they're like, "Well, it's it takes over the place over fifteen years. It just doesn't feel the same." I'm like, "That's good. It, I don't want it to be the same fucking movie." Oh, why would it? Oh. Yeah, that's that's a weird that's a weird critique. Yeah, <laughs> it's a different movie. Okay, why would we want Fury Road again? Uh, yeah, we have Fury Road. But uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, uh, any other movies you guys have seen lately? Yeah, but we we can't sit here and talk for thirty minutes uh, about Challengers. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll never eat a churro the same way again. 
Anyway, th- thanks for listening, everybody. Next week on the Harbor, we're going to be back for our final Apes cast doing Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. So look forward to that. If you yeah. are catching up on the Planet of the Apes episode or you know, movies, rather, we have episodes on all of them except for the Tim Burton one. So go check that out. And also, if uh, the movie isn't good or if I'm not on the next cast, um, it means the movie isn't good because I killed myself because that guy's making the Zelda movie. So... I got emotional stakes in this one. Right. So right. check that out. We have like 150 <laughs> videos on this channel uh, where I've got a new uh, essay coming out. Thousand soon. subscribers. Yeah. Uh, tentatively, we should be doing a tenant video. So look forward to that. And then tentatively. we have a uh, tie-in movie called Patrician's Got to Kino. Check that out below. Oh, shit. We have a book i wrote a book you can check that out below if you want to support the channel anything else share us subscribe all that cool stuff yeah anyway. follow me on instagram at scott k comedy i got shows coming up at little rock hey uh, adrian stop dragging this thing out we should have been done like 30 minutes ago come on <laughs> thanks guys we'll see you next week